You boys be quiet down there! Hello and welcome to Basement Brothers. We're going to do an E3 podcast. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is going to be a regular thing. We had opinions about E3. We figured we'd talk about it, record it, and we'll see if it's something people want to hear. So now normally our channel is going to be focused on... Uh, older games from the 80s and 90s, but uh, E3 is the big news this week, so we'll we'll give it a go. So to start out, let's just do some quick introductions. Um, you guys want to go first? Hey, I'm Alec. Uh, I usually do the Neo Geo reviews on the channel right now. Um, Mr. Jakes, and I've been doing the PC88 Paradise series, um, reviewing games for the old uh, NEC PC88 computers system. So if anybody's interested in that, please check it out once you're done listening to this podcast. And I'm Stu Rat. I do nothing. I eventually am going to be putting out videos as well. I've got some recording of Master System games that uh, have been sitting on my hard drive for a couple of months, but life has been difficult. But anyway, that'll hopefully come up later. So to start out... Um, Let's just talk what were what were our overall impressions of the show this year. Well, I think besides the Nintendo Switch, which is kind of its own thing, the key word I think for Microsoft and Sony this year was 4K, definitely. Um, they're focusing a lot on maybe... They, they say they're going to still keep working on making 1080p look better, but they're really focusing on making as many games as possible uh, viewable in 4K now. Right, right. So the uh, the the new consoles, the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One, that's going to be the the new battle going forward. And this is sort of our introduction to that battle. Uh, but my impression overall of E3 was kind of dull. I mean, I I feel like a lot of people felt that it was not a lot of new games. There was a lot of stuff that we'd already seen kind of being rehashed, or we're getting to see a little more of what we've already seen. And there wasn't a lot on offer this year and that maybe speaks to the lessening relevance of e3 these days uh yeah i i totally agree that the um the games on display really seem to be things that we'd already heard i was surprised by how few announcements there really were of of you know new reveals but i still think there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff to see and to talk about um, can we start by focusing on on microsoft's conference since they they were first uh, besides um, Microsoft's big reveal for the Xbox One X, uh, they spent a lot of time talking about that hardware, but especially for Nintendo and Sony, it was all about the games. And then Microsoft, too, they, they spent a lot of time just showing new games, which I guess is kind of what we expected, but there weren't, like you said, there weren't a whole lot of new surprises. Um, there weren't a whole lot of new franchises. There's a lot of old franchises with, with new installments, and not not too many surprises for most people. I was I was actually pleasantly surprised by how few hardware gimmicks they really got out this year. I mean, um, Sony brought out the the VR again. I wasn't sure how hard they'd push that, and we'll talk more about that later. And Nintendo is still doing Amiibos. I wasn't sure whether that was going to be a, a continuing trend or if it was kind of waning. But um, you know, we didn't have a lot about augmented reality or you know, tie-in smartphone games, or they didn't have you, like, standing on a skateboard or anything weird like that. It was really just games controlled with a with a traditional controller, and, and that was actually kind of refreshing, although it's not quite as interesting as, like, when they first revealed the Nintendo Revolution, and, and people were like, ooh, am I going to be able to use the the controller like a dentist drill now? You know, it's not quite mm -hmm. as exciting, but I think a lot of people would prefer that they, they don't do anything too out there. Yeah, everyone except Microsoft had their consoles out of the way, right, since we already got the Switch out. And uh, there was a little bit of speculation. I was wondering if there was the faintest possibility that Sony would talk about launching a PS5 this year, but that seemed like a really remote possibility. Yeah, it was definitely way too early for another Sony console already. I think already by this point, I think for the average consumer now, the the market seems pretty flooded now, especially with, with the Xbox One, the Xbox One S, and the Xbox One X. I mean, I, I don't even know. 
I, I think it's that Microsoft is going to have a hard time with the with the Xbox One X with the, with the price tag. I don't think the average consumer is going to be is going to know whether they want it or not, basically. But I, that that's mm-hmm. probably what they're they're trying to do anyway. They have the Xbox One X for the for the high end gamer who wants the the best graphics possible, and then they'll still the other gamers will still be able to play the same games on on the cheaper systems. So I guess that's what they're going for. You know what's interesting is I read somewhere that the PS4 original sells about four times as well as the PS4 Pro. You're talking Pro. about Jim Ryan and, from Sony? Uh, allegedly, the, the folks at Microsoft would be happy, at least to start out, if, if the Xbox One X and Xbox One S have similar uh, sales where where they they don't expect this to suddenly be the thing that everybody gets it's it's uh you know it's a second skew it's another option but they're they're not expecting it to be as big as a brand new you know completely new generation so obviously uh, Microsoft opened the show with their reveal of the new console were you impressed i mean what were your impressions otherwise of the Xbox 1X so as as Mr. Jakes was saying, the the others were a lot more focused on the games. Uh, obviously, Microsoft had the new new hardware to show off, but like they they seem to take themselves really seriously. Like they had this video at the very beginning that had phrases like "It's all leading up to this," and they showed the different like resolutions of the previous systems. Uh, a little aside, I thought it was hilarious that they they didn't list the Xbox 360 as 1080p. They they said it was 720, which really, I mean, you look at games like Halo 3, it wasn't even 720, arguably. Um, so that that was that was amusing. I kind of wondered yeah. what the thought was behind that. Was that was the age of 720p. That was the resolution then. I mean, I, even if I some guess. games were in 1080p, it was almost almost everything was in 720, even if it was scaled up to 1080 on the Microsoft. Uh, yeah, they kind of had no choice the there. Xbox 360. They want to say the Xbox One generation, PS4 generation is 1080p, and they're going to list the 360 in that same list, then that's where it goes. There's really no choice. They kind of pigeonhole themselves there. Yeah, I just thought it was funny (laughs) how they're trying to get people really excited about 4K while at the same time kind of admitting that this other system that they used to tout as full HD at 1080p really wasn't most of the time. Um and then, and then also that they're just, it's so incremental and in saying it's all been leading up to this. This is super important right now. And, and really it's just like, Ooh, the, the resolution's even higher now. Um, that, that just seemed like they weren't really reading the audience. Like they're trying to get people really excited and buzzed, but the buzz is really that instead of doing traditional console generations, we're doing smaller, more incremental updates that still run the same software. And so it's kind of like contradictory. Yeah, so what do you guys think of the name, the Xbox One X? Is that about what you expected, or how do you like it? I laughed at that name when I first heard it. That's a lot of X's in one (laughs) game console name. Right. Yeah, I was actually really disappointed. Um, And I'm um, Eden Crow here. I actually have to admit right here that I was wrong. I've been actually correcting people for a year uh, people have been referring to it as an the Xbox One Scorpio, and I said, no, 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 wait. They told us that this is they're done with console generations. It's not going to be called the Xbox One. I told everyone because Xbox One was a poor seller for them. They haven't really had good luck with that name, and they said that this is they're they're going to do incremental going forward. Here, it's going to be like every few years they're going to do a new console, and it's just going to kind of flow into the next one and that might still happen but Mm -hmm. my thinking was when they when they went with the name xbox one x like i was all wrong because i was planning to pre-order this console right away when it comes when it becomes available and uh my thinking was i was getting on board for a whole new xbox here i thought that this was going to be their next Xbox period, and this is just how Xboxes are going to be going forward. Like it's it's been four years. Once the Xbox One X comes out, the Xbox One original will be four years old. So I think four years is actually long enough for 
uh, a console generation. We used to have systems. Uh, the original Xbox was only out mm-hmm. for four years. Before well, well, and and the, the original came out. The original Xbox didn't sell particularly well. Like the PlayStation Two ran away with that generation, and so yeah. anybody else, it's in their best interest to reset that. And so you know, Microsoft released their next console a year before everybody else. Um, but going back to the name, you know, I think that the the name sounds a little dumb, but uh, really, I can't remember the last time I heard a new game system name and thought it sounded good. Like maybe Ultra sixty four, uh, and then they didn't keep that. <laughs> and I'm half jo- Virtual Boy actually sounds pretty good. That that was about what. But usually the like Scorpio sounds cooler to me than Xbox One X. But you know, so does like Dural and Katana sound cooler than Dreamcast. And people laughed at GameCube. It's like mm-hmm. now we got a cube, we got a box and a cube. Yeah, <laughs> so confused. Yeah, or the Wii. I mean, can you remember people's yeah. reactions when they first announced um, the Wii? I never got used to it. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think it, it is usually, you know, we all we all think it sounds funny at first, and we just get used to it. When yeah, the week it rolls off the tongue. You know, I heard them refer to the Xbox One S and the Xbox One X, and that really sounds like, you know, smartphone naming right now. And I, I think they're really trying to get the business to be more similar to the way smartphones are, where you've got updates every every year, or probably in this case, probably two years. But um, and and so like this is the Xbox One X, and maybe the next one has a different name, but it's also incremental and backwards compatible. I mean, part of this is that. I think the um, the way the hardware works, they really don't expect the uh, hardware to be substantially different. Like, it's pretty easy to make things backward compatible, so why wouldn't you? Yeah, you don't have the separate SPEs and stuff that the PS3 had. These days, it's more standardized uh, mm-hmm. uh, X64 hardware. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking that backward compatibility is going to be more standard going forward, maybe yep. even on the, the next Sony console. Yeah, I assume. Yeah, and at the same time, they're also releasing a lot of these Xbox One exclusives for the PC, too, for Windows 10. So it's really all made to run on a lot of different um, types of hardware now while using the exact same games, basically. But ultimately, regardless of the name, I mean, the hardware, we already were introduced to the hardware like a month ago. So it is it doesn't really make a difference in the end. It's the same thing. So I'm still planning to pre-order one. Um, but I kind of feel like, okay, uh, generations are here to stay for now. Like we're still in the Xbox one generation. Maybe it's going to be like seven years long this generation before we see the PS five. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Personally, I have the regular PS four and I'm still, I'm still planning on just sticking with the regular PS four probably for the rest of this year. At least I don't have a 4k TV and I don't know. I, I, I know that there's. 1080p is going to look better, even even if I don't have a 4K TV. Tech N7 doesn't benefit. go in 1080p without a PS4 Pro. Yeah, there's there's a yeah. few games where where if you like, especially if you want 60 frames per second in 1080p, you need a PS4 Pro. I've 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 got mixed feelings about it because I also have a vanilla PS4 still, and you know you you definitely notice. I mean, there are some games that go well below 30 frames per second. And and it's like, do I bite or or do I just get used to the choppier frame rates? Yeah, I'm not planning to upgrade to a 4K TV yet either, but I'm still planning to get the the Xbox One X. Well, yeah, I realize it would look everything would look better with a PS4 Pro, but so far I'm still really impressed by the look of the regular PS4. I mean, I just played through Horizon Zero Dawn and I thought it looked beautiful on the regular PS4, and everyone says yeah. it looks a lot better on PS4 Pro. Well, maybe not a lot better. A lot of pe- people are saying it looks better on PS4 Pro, especially if you have a 4K TV. But That's to maybe me, not it was the best still example. it was still good enough. Like okay, maybe there's going to be more games in the future where it makes a bigger difference. But so far, I'm pretty satisfied as long as I can still play the games at all. At this point, maybe I'm not at this point like really looking for the best possible technological experience right now. I'm just happy to be able to play the games, and there's probably a lot of gamers like that. <laughs> that that's the gamer camp. That's the four out of the five Sony owners who don't buy the <laughs> pro that you're describing there. So. 
yeah, the five hundred dollar price tag. I kind of thought that was what I was expecting. Mm-hmm. Like that's they've they've been touting this as the pro level hardware all along, a premium system. So five hundred seems reasonable to me. Five hundred is actually what the original Xbox One cost with the camera, so that's doable. I think that people who are looking for a high power gaming rig might bite for that because compared to the equivalent gaming pc like that's going to be a very actually reasonable price point well here's the counter argument to that though um you already have a computer and if you or you're you're planning on buying a computer no matter what one that can play that kind of game but but could you upgrade it you know if you spent a few hundred dollars on a graphics card and you spent a hundred dollars to max out your ram would that be as good as an xbox one x I don't think so. When you look at all of the custom chips and cooling they've got in this thing, this would be equivalent to a pretty advanced gaming PC you'd probably have to build from the ground up right now at this point, unless you have a really nice rig. Yeah, I mean, I I really think that the audience for this um, is slightly different from the audience for a PC. You know, there's the type of person who really likes uh, customizing it. It's their hot rod. Um... And then there's the type of person who like has a, a home theater in their basement and they they have people over and they want it to just work. You know, like when the when the new game comes out, they don't want it to have game breaking bugs. They don't want to have to deal with driver updates and stuff. And yep. and for that type of person Yeah. All three of us are like in that console camp though, because we all we all grew up with it. Yeah, although pretty much. Yeah. You know, I'm not the <laughs> Like I don't think I'm the intended audience for this. Like I, I have a game room, but I don't bring people down into it to show off. Like I, it's not like look at my great setup. It's I've got a fairly small TV and I just sit close to it. And like if people come in here, I'm nervous that they're gonna touch the games. Like I am not the intended audience for this. This is for uh, back when I back when I worked for a few months at a major electronics retailer, we kind of profiled the customers. Like the training was to identify which people were different types, and one of the types was Buzz. And this is somebody who's just really excited by new stuff, and you just want to share that excitement with them and not have them think too hard about it. Just try to make the the purchase quickly, and that's really this is this is for Buzz right here. This isn't for someone who's necessarily really thinking hard about their purchase. Uh, those people might be more likely to be a PC gamer or someone who's really weighing the options and saying, you know, they're probably going to release another console in two years and I can wait until then and just, you know, I don't have a 4K TV yet. The frame rates might be slightly worse, but but that's fine for two years. But I think you you have the serious gamers on top of that too who want the best. And I I played some of the I played Forza Horizon three on the PC, which is a bit supposed to be an Xbox One exclusive, but it's also available for Windows ten. And I can say it was a lot more trouble playing it on the PC. I mean, yeah. the, Microsoft has like a store that they have mm-hmm. in Windows ten that they use to to like download and update games, and it it's a lot more. It doesn't work very well. I mean, they've said they're improving it, but it's still there's there's lots of complaints, and it doesn't work well. So, so basically, anytime they say something's an Xbox One exclusive, it's really on Windows 10, but you probably can't play it on Steam. You have to do the, the Windows Store, right? The wording was Xbox One and Windows 10 exclusive. And for timed exclusive, they were using the phrase Xbox One console launch exclusive. So the verbal hoops they are jumping through just to get that message across are becoming mm-hmm. too great. Well, yeah, like you were saying, there's still the PC gamer who's more willing to deal with those kind of issues, even though they, they will complain if there's if things aren't working as well as they should. To be fair, I mean, Steam and like Ubisoft's online like game updating system work a lot better right now than Microsoft's do. But yeah, like you said, console gamers are still going to want to be able to just hook it up and, and for it to just work as, as quickly as possible. Of course, nowadays, there's still a lot of updates and things they mm-hmm. have to do, but it, it Overall, it's much more user-friendly still than the PC option. Yeah, it is, but I do think that the difference is is getting smaller. And there could be a future where, where a lot of people who currently think they'd never be PC gamers eventually become them. I was also thinking, it's interesting you mentioned the, the Microsoft Store. Back in the old days, we, we would talk about platforms, and I guess aside from like a thing that you stand on, 
uh, is, you know, like platform just meant which console it was on. But now there's just so many different platforms people are trying to dominate. You know, there's there's the there's the console, but then there's also what uh, what online dis- distribution store you've got, whether it's Microsoft competing with with Valve there and and you know, you've got the different social networks of whether this is on Twitch or Mixer. I, I don't do any of those, so I, I just kind of tune out whenever they talk about that stuff. Uh, or like social media, like I, I don't do any any gaming stuff on, on Facebook or anything like that. I don't quite understand who that's for, but there's just so many different levels now. And they're trying to target a lot of them, like uh, Microsoft. They're trying to target people who want the most expensive console and people who want the cheaper version of the same console and the PC gamers. Before, there were people who were probably PC gamers who really wanted to play a, a Microsoft Xbox exclusive. And nowadays, they don't have to even buy a Microsoft console if, mm-hmm. if they have a, a good enough PC with Windows 10. So I thought it was it was interesting how they, they brought out the, the reveal of the new Porsche car like I think they're really trying to to make the Xbox One X come across as this luxury item, and so when you talk about the five hundred dollar price, um, five hundred dollars isn't that much to spend on something that makes you feel rich. You know, like a sports car uh, is is a whole whole other order of magnitude there, and so so I think they're hoping to uh, to uh, get some of that prestige brand tied in with the Xbox One X. Yeah, that's what that's how they've been marketing it all along running up to the E3. I thought there was a lot of talking from game developers on the Microsoft one and that kind of padded it out and and stretched it out and people say maybe the Sony one had more games even though they were games we we've seen already, but they just focused on the games at the Sony one and perhaps the the, the Nintendo one that it, it was shorter but they were really focused on their message there of of being able to take it anywhere and just the games. That was kind of the, the, the biggest complaint with Microsoft here. Well, I, I don't mind hearing from the developers, but I don't feel like they had that much to say. Like, I, I was looking back at the Microsoft one and thinking, did they actually announce anything? And I, I guess Ori, the, the Ori and the Blind Forest sequel hadn't been announced until that, that press conference. But but I think that's about it. Like, they, they confirmed that Cuphead is still happening uh, I feel like if they hadn't mentioned Cuphead, we would have assumed it was it was dead. Um, so that that was nice that they kind of re-announced that. Um, yeah, but otherwise, no blockbusters. Mm-hmm. Well, no I mean, Halo, no Gears of War. So, but so here's Forza was it? Yeah, here's the difference between between Microsoft's and Sony's. Like at the end, I I knew what their main points were. I knew that Forza was the game they were really pushing, and and the, you know the the conference was mostly about the new Xbox One X. With the uh, Sony conference, I I read somebody's live blog before actually watching it, and after reading the notes, I could not tell you what was the what was the big game that they were trying to push or what was their main point? And after watching the Sony one, I, I can go back and say, okay, sure, they, they're saying if you like the kind of games we've had on PlayStation, we've got a whole lot more of them. You know, we've got another God of War, we've got another Uncharted, we've got another, um, you know, Heavy Rain type game from that, from Quantic Dreams. I don't know. You know, we've got another one of those. We've got another Spider-Man which I guess they haven't done in a while, and and those were those were the big Sony games. Spider Man is from Insomniac. It looks really good, actually. So I felt like Microsoft set the bar pretty low, um, and I was expecting Sony to come out guns a blazing and be like in 2015 when they when they had Final Fantasy VII and Last Guardian and and uh, Shenmue Three and Gravity Rush Two, and there was just nothing like that. The Sony one. I, I really don't think they announced anything new and exciting that that I was I was interested in. I mean, they confirmed and showed some footage of stuff we already knew about, but that that was it. Yeah, there weren't any actual games announced that we hadn't heard about before, I guess. But they showed a lot of game footage for some of these games we've heard about before mm-hmm. that we hadn't seen anyway, like God of War. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The I thought it was interesting that um, in the new God of War. He doesn't use the the long sickle thing anymore. He's just carrying an axe, and I wonder if if they're taking some inspiration from some other games like like Dark Souls. Like it, the camera was a lot closer to him than in previous games. I imagine that the the weapons will change, just like in the previous games. 
Um, what did you guys think about their, they still had PlayStation VR at the show? Was it uh, something they should still be pushing? Is this going to be a win for them? I think they still think it, it starts from here. Like They haven't had that much sales of it so far, but I think they still think there's an audience out there for it that hasn't bought it yet, but will soon. I thought it was really weird. You know, they, they had this whole separate reel of PlayStation VR games that looked like they were kind of lower budget, but they were all these new interesting concepts. And, and that actually was one of the more interesting parts of the of the Sony part for me is I wasn't sure how much they would talk about PlayStation VR. And uh, they, they did have a slew of new games. They all look kind of low budget, but... Uh, yeah, the VR dedicated games are more like uh, little gimmicky things, mm-hmm. kind of like the old Wii games. The thing about VR though is there are uh, there are like internet cafe kind of places you can go to now where you can pay to play PlayStation VR or other VR for an hour or something like that. So I see it being like that same kind of gimmick. I remember when the Wii came out. And there were places you could go to just go play Wii, and it was almost like a genre onto itself. So I think they're kind of like hoping for some of that action with VR. Um, I feel like people have gone in and tried it out in stores, and people were generally impressed with it. I just don't feel like gen- the, the core gaming audience that buys AAA titles is really all that interested in it. I, I've seen a lot of mostly negativity about VR online. Well, I just, I was surprised by how few games support it. You know, like when they first announced it, I kind of assumed that most games would be like Resident Evil 7, where you can just use VR and play the game, and that it wouldn't be these separate, like for Final Fantasy 15, they announced they've got a special version of the fishing mini game, which is like the least interesting part of the game, in my opinion. I'm sure some people would disagree with that. I mean, I love other fishing games like Get Bass, but... I couldn't believe, I thought that was got to be more than just fishing. I thought that was a joke. Yeah, and <laughs> so I, I, I just kind of assumed when they announced PlayStation VR and when people were talking about all the other VR headsets, they would just be like, okay, I can play a regular game and they will all be compatible with stereoscopic 3D and head tracking and I'll just play the game. But you still want stuff designed specifically for VR with VR in mind, right? You don't want it to be just a viewing option for regular games. I I think a lot of us would would prefer that. Like I think they made it sound like it would be a lot more mainstream than it turned out and maybe part of it I was I think a lot of us a lot of us would rather look at a regular TV and not get a headache looking at that. Yeah, yeah, of course. But like Stuart's saying, it seems like there's more games that they could make work just fine with VR, or you would be able to play it either way you like, and it would still work fine. I, I kind of still expecting that. Like, they can easily just add... I mean, they've had a bunch of games like Tekken and, and Resident Evil where they have uh, VR added as an option added into it. So I'd still kind of expecting to see some of that. And if we don't, then I would say it's kind of the end for PlayStation VR. They're actually releasing old games like Elder Scrolls Skyrim again for PlayStation VR now. Instead of making new games that are that are for either one, you can play either way. They're taking old games that were non-VR games and turning them into VR games. That's for people who really want to replay it in VR, I guess. Well, I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I think some of the best Wii games were old GameCube games that were redone with pointer controls. Yeah, and how did that sell? How did people feel about that? Uh, I think the Wii did pretty well overall. <laughs> yeah, but but the other software on the Wii, though, was all considered shovelware for the most part. So I, I think it's a gimmick. I think for now it's a gimmick they have in their court, but they're, 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 I don't know how much longer. It'll totally depend on whether or not the gimmick stays relevant at all to anybody, and I think the core gamers already have sort of moved on. Yeah, I mean, I would there's not a future be surprised. For, for sure. Oh, oh, there's definitely there's a future for it. I just yeah. don't know if it's. I don't know if it's the time yet. Now, if it's gonna, if it's gonna take yet. The the technology has gotten a lot better for certainly, and it, it looks. It's definitely arrived at a point now where it it wasn't like just a few years ago. But but I'm. I don't know if the consumer is still gonna take it yet or not. I don't know if it needs to be a PlayStation add-on though. I don't. The PlayStation buyers aren't necessarily looking for that and then you have to buy a console as well as the vr i think for it to really take off at some point they're gonna there's gonna have to be a separate product it can be a playstation product but i think 
it, it probably won't be an add-on. It'll have to be its own thing that takes off on its That's own. a good idea. They should just make a whole separate console for it that people can buy if that's what they want. No, I think I think you meant the opposite, right? Where it's not a separate console. It's something that, that works with, with you know all consoles or PCs and everything. No, 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 no. That's right. <laughs> no, just make a separate console called the PlayStation VR. It's too late for that now, of course, but if they just made a separate console called the VR. It's a box that you buy, and it comes with the VR goggles and everything. And, and it just has a completely separate sl- slew of games that you play on it? Well, ideally, it would be nice if it, used, if it could use some of the same games, but I don't know if they would do it that way or not. I was disappointed we didn't see a, a Vita two at the conference. <laughs> I think they're kind of they're leaving that that portable market. Yeah, I think they've there given might up. Might have been an opportunity there. Uh, I think there was room for a Vita two. I think the original Vita was sort of, people. It had definitely had its fan base, and uh, I mean, I don't think portable is gone. I think for a while it was dominated by smartphones, and kind of sad that Sony's not in in that market anymore. Kind of leaving it just to Nintendo. Yeah, it's it's like, and we've been saying it for years. It's because of smartphones, but it's gotten it's just gotten worse to the point now you can't really sell a, a portable very successfully. Like the market can only support one selling well, I think, right now, and Nintendo is going to be the one in, who continues to take that slot. Okay, they also showed Marvel versus Capcom Infinite at the Sony show. Uh, what did you think? Is they were really unveiling the story mode here, and that's what they were was on display at the show. They're capitalizing on the Marvel expanded universe and the popularity of the movies, so they thought it was time to release another game using the Marvel license. Uh, I I just thought it looked terrible. I mean, <laughs> the, the I mean the the graphics were so far behind. Chun Li's face was just painted on. Her eyebrows were lifeless. It was pretty. Yeah, I agree. Actually, actually. and uh, uh, actually, they were making fun of KOF fourteen before that came out, and now everyone's praising KOF fourteen. But if they want to make fun of some uh, fighting games for how the the graphics look, this is this is what you should be making fun of. I thought this was really sad, and I thought the story looked ridiculous. And I, I said, just show us the game. Just show. Nobody wants to see this crazy story with these marvel characters like oh look it's chun li and ryu meet magneto or something this is gonna be great i don't i don't even if the graphics look kind of funny we only we only want to see the game people are gonna buy it though people are but big marvel fans are definitely gonna gonna buy it i think so they need they need that audience in addition to the core fighting demographic. Oh, there's definitely an audience for it. Yeah, and I mean there's there's probably hardcore Capcom fighting game fans who are going to buy it too. And there's lots of people who re- who fondly remember Marvel versus Capcom. So yeah, there's definitely an audience for it, even if people make fun of the the look of the graphics. <laughs> I I think you guys are wrong on a lot of counts there. So first of all, I, I think that people really do care about the story in fighting games. I mean, that's that's how you convince people to keep sure. buying the latest iteration is they care about the yeah. characters, they care about their interactions. I mean, half of the trailer was like, look at these clever things that happen when you get Marvel and Capcom together. You know, you've got Rocket Raccoon yeah. taking the guns from Dante and like like that's that's what the fans want. The thing that I thought was yeah, really exactly. interesting oh. is is emphasizing oh, I agree with that. Is, is emphasizing the story mode because the story mode in Street Fighter V was was so weird. I don't know if you guys are existent. Well, so at first there there was there was no like arcade mode or whatever, and so then later they added this free update to Street Fighter V that was like a four hour long cinematic story where you had these characters all talking b- before each fight, and it was it was actually pretty interesting. Like graphically, it looked pretty good, and they they had like all of the different uh, cami dolls for you to fight and some some non-player characters that you could beat up. And so, so it was actually pretty involved, but the problem was they didn't bother adding any AI that was fun to fight against. So like when Street Fighter V first launched, there was a survival mode. The AI was stupid. It wasn't very fun to fight against. It was really just focused on online. So they, I mean, there was this big o- outrage over the lack of, of a good one-player mode. So they add this super elaborate story that still has brain-dead AI. And, and it was not fun to play at all. So I'm, I'm really curious if they have this big elaborate story for, for Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. 
Are they going to finally figure out how to make AI opponents that are fun to fight against to justify all that? So, so otherwise, they, they might as well do something like Titanfall, where, where you have the story segments and then you just fight online between them if they can't figure out how to make, how to make the AI fun. Yeah, maybe this was their answer to some of that criticism of lack of story before. Should we talk about the Nintendo uh, announcements a little bit? So overall n- impressions of Nintendo... So Nintendo is interesting. Like, I think that they win by default just because they actually announced stuff that we didn't know about yet. You know, they they announced the two Metroid games. They announced Kirby and Yoshi and and Pokemon for the Switch. Which is weird. They usually almost kind of skip E3 and do their own thing. Yeah, I mean, for several years now, they've just been doing the pre-recorded things. And I really like that. Like, Nintendo's got this weird demographic where they're selling to children and they're selling to older people who, like, uh, you know, have more going on in their lives than the core, like, Xbox, PlayStation demographic, I think. And so the thing they have in common is that both don't have a lot of attention span, and so having a shorter presentation that's just really quickly focused on announcing the games was a good fit for both the little kids and the, the busy adults. Yeah, and so Switch is selling well, so this is kind of like a victory lap almost for them. I mean, I think it's too early to say that. I mean, they, they've they only manufactured a few million Switches, and so, yeah, they're selling out. There's still enough demand that scalpers are making slightly more than the MSRP, but but it, it, it'll be it'll take longer to really say how successful Switch is. But I think that Mario Odyssey, uh, you know, looks, looks really solid. It, it looks a lot like Mario Sunshine, which isn't, like, I prefer the Galaxy games over, over Sunshine. I prefer how they're a lot more focused, and this looks a lot more open-ended. Um, but, you know, yeah. I was pleasantly surprised with how much I enjoyed Zelda Breath of the Wild, and that was a lot more open-world focused, too. I think it's kind of interesting how you still have those same Nintendo properties, but they're they're chasing trends a little bit with open world games with Zelda and Mario or esports kind of with Splatoon and Arms. I like the idea of the of the hats because it's really clear whatever object or thing that Mario possesses, it's got the hat and then it's got the mustache. So I think it's really it's very clear to players and you kind of get that character coming out all the time. It, it's it's a neat gimmick that they have planned for this one. Did you guys hear how there's a two player mode where the second player plays the hat? Yeah. People people yeah, were laughing yeah, at how Luigi Luigi got the the shaft. He instead of being able to play Luigi, you play as the hat. The hat, I don't know if that'll be like a full-on second player or just sort of you can tag along. It'll be like the Tails mode in, in Sonic 2 and 3. <laughs> yeah, or maybe something like in in like uh, Mario Galaxy or Blaster Master Zero where you can just have a cursor that kind of interacts with stuff. Seems like something kind of in between those. They showed at the Ubisoft conference the Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. What do you think of this? It's kind of a new idea, huh? Yeah, I mean, they're making a big deal about it. I mean, but in the end, it's just a turn-based strategy game. <laughs> Not personally. Everyone says it's like XCOM, basically. I mean, you're the one who loves turn-based strategy games. This one doesn't look like one you would play. What, me? Um, <laughs> I don't know. It like, uh, Out of the three it of depends. us, yes. For turn-based strategy, it really depends. The action needs to be addictive and everything. It might be... I'd have to actually play it to find out. And, I mean, the story and the characters and stuff is important as well. So, you know, it might be good. I don't know. My wife was watching this one with me, and she just loved the rabbits. She was. She just said, oh, it's so cute. So she wants this. She didn't care what the game was. Before they even showed the game, she was like, give me that. So... The characters, for sure, are appealing. I think the theme definitely could sell this one, even if the game itself is not anything special. Yeah, I'll have to wait on reviews, although it seems like the type of game that the reviews aren't going to be that telling. You know, people are just going to focus on how it's this surprising concept, and they won't necessarily say whether it's a well-paced and and novel game. But, it, I mean, the initial impression is, yeah, it's surprising, and... It, it does look like it's it's more novel than most of the stuff that they, they presented at E3. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It'll probably be good. I mean, the, the rabbits are... A lot of people like them. They're funny and cute and everything. And the gameplay, I mean, it looked, it looked pretty interesting. They have those things where you can... The characters can assist each other by, like, having them 
boost them and like and make them jump to another yeah. area and then like attack the enemy from behind and stuff like that. And I mean, it could be a lot of fun. It'll be interesting to see whether this is the type of strategy game like if if hardcore Nipponichi fans are going to also say, "Yeah, this is actually pretty solid." Or if if they're going to turn their nose up on it. Yeah, we'll have to see how it plays. Uh, they also had some Metroid announcements. So they are apparently making a Metroid Prime 4, but that's really all we know. We know that it's not being made by Retro Studio this mm-hmm. time, though. So, um, But I think a lot of fans were excited that they are continuing that series. Yeah, it's it's basically vaporware, right? I mean, all we all we have is a logo, and they've ruled out one developer. There's there's somebody making it, and it's. <laughs> but it is one of those announcements where it's acknowledging, yes, we are making this, mm-hmm. so people get excited. And but they did more substantially show Samus Returns on the 3DS. Uh, what did you think of that? It looks like it's apparently a remake of Metroid Two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got to say, like every time they they are in a planning meeting at Nintendo for the next Metroid game. They'll, they'll say something, and there's got to be someone in the room who says, just, am, am I insane here? I'm, I'm pretty sure we all know what the fans want, right? Like, they, they basically want <laughs> something that's like Super Metroid, but it's, you know, different enough to, to still be novel, and maybe make it look a little better, like, make it look at least as good as Symphony of the Night. Like, like that's what everybody wants, right? Am I crazy? Am I crazy? And then, and then someone at the at the table says, like, yeah, you know, that's really expensive, and we don't really have the internal development for that, so we're going to make this 3DS game that's got polygonal graphics, and it's going to be made by the team that scuttled the Castlevania series, and, and it's going to be Return of Jafar, basically. And <laughs> so here's the thing, though. I was watching the, the demonstration video, and I was like, yeah, this, this looks kind of disappointing. I, I don't know about it. And I still probably will buy it. And then when I thought that, I realized, no, this is why they keep doing this. This is why they keep outsourcing their games. Yeah, and- they, they've got you, Sirat. Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> I'll tell you. I, I just, I would rather play the original Metroid 2. I mean, they, why, why play this ugly 2.5D thing that they've made? Why do they have to keep remaking stuff like this? People, I guess... Maybe the younger generation doesn't know the original or they haven't played Metroid 2 and they won't because it's in black and white on the original Game Boy, so they need it remade. Well, I mean, I think there are some things that that will be better. I mean, I like that it's got the map screen and and I think it's cool that you can um, pin points on the map. Like, I really like games where you can edit the map yourself, so that'll be nice. But but overall, like it, it just it looked pretty milk toast. I, I I'm not excited about the analog aiming or anything like that. Like it's yeah, they added a few things. I'm sure there's somebody who's who will enjoy it. I mean, if it's got the traditional sure. like side scrolling tra- like oh, Metroid no. type exploration, then it it should be somebody will want it. I think people It'll be a ton of fun. People are excited from what I've heard. People are excited. But my point is, yeah. I I don't think there's a single person who heard the description of this game and said, ooh, a Metroid 2 remake for the 3DS with polygon graphics and analog aiming made by Mercury Steam, this is as good as it could possibly be. This is exactly what I... Like, nobody says that. There's probably someone really excited who doesn't care who is developing it. <laughs> they, they've had some misfires with Metroid recently, so I think some people might just be happy that they're doing a straight metroid game at all well here's the thing so people complain about other m having having a terrible story and all that and and it it was pretty bad but from what i played of other m the biggest problem was actually the the polygon graphics like you you have to look around the room and and find secrets and when it's 2d it's iconic it's really easy to see what's there quickly and see which things are out of place and surprising and, and obviously having a 2.5D game where you don't have to look around the room is going to solve some of that. But still, like, it's not going to be as easy to find, as, as easy to, or fun to find secrets when when the environments are, are drawn out in 3D, in my opinion. Doesn't that apply to Metroid Prime? Well, Metroid Prime did a lot of things differently, you know, where you've got the scanner and, you know, I, th- I think that it was fun to be able to scan things and it made it so you could tell what 
was interactive and which things were all one piece. But in general, I don't I don't like 3D games because there's too much to look at. I like having a 2D game where you can see the entire room all at once and identify, okay, oh, that part's kind of funny. I'm going to put a bomb there. So Other M needed a scanner. Uh, Other M needed a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, so overall, the Nintendo one, I kind of feel like they rest on their laurels a little bit every year. Uh, they, they announced another Yoshi, they announced another Kirby. It's kind of like each generation, like, here's another one of these, here's another one mm-hmm. of these. Like, you don't get too many surprises with Nintendo. No, uh... That's why everyone was happy when they saw a new franchise, finally, with Splatoon. That was actually announced in 2014. Doesn't, doesn't that seem like it was pretty recent? Um, but yeah, I mean, like, there's never been a bad Kirby game, but the the one they announced looks a lot like Return to Dreamland on the Wii, and um, I'm excited about Yoshi. I mean, it's it's another game from Good Feel. They they made Wario Land, Shake It, and and Kirby's Epic Yarn, and and Yoshi's Woolly Wo- World, and th- they're all great. Um, but they look so similar to the previous games and, and really pretty similar to everything they've been making for the last 20-some years. And it would be nice if companies spent more time on, on R&D to come up with new concepts and make the games look different instead of just so many sequels and even just having them look the same as the previous ones. Speaking of previous games, one of the biggest applause lines in the Microsoft show was the announcement of original Xbox backward compatibility. Are you guys excited to have this? (laughs) 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 I wasn't really that impressed with Xbox 360 backward compatibility. I know it's, like, important to people, but for me, like, I still have, as someone who still has the old systems hooked up, and there isn't there isn't a lot of uh, enhancement when you play mm-hmm. the games on the Xbox One for most games. Yeah, I so think... So I don't get too excited about it. I think people are going to be disappointed by how few games have substantial enhancements on new hardware. Like, when I bought a Wii U, I, I assumed that it was going to play Wii games in HD, and maybe that makes me sound really stupid, but, like... Really, why it wouldn't have been that hard to at least make most of them work. Like when you put when you buy an Xbox One X, like how many of the games are actually going to run in 4K? How many of the games are going to run substantially better at all? Yeah, it sounds like quite a bit from what they've said. There, any games that don't have locked frame rates or locked resolutions will actually automatically go up as high as they can <laughs> the power on the Xbox One X. So that's good. But uh, I I think people will also be disappointed with the lack of titles that will be supported by this backward compatibility. I mean, it's going to be just whatever lackluster list that they can put together that they think people are interested in playing. It sounds a lot the same as the backwards compatibility from the 360. (laughs) Yeah, it it is the same thing. But I, I feel like they do it just so they can say they have it. Because I've got my Shikigami no Shiro games that that I bought when I was visiting you in Japan, and I still can't play them on the Xbox 360 or the Xbox One, because <laughs> they're probably never going to support backward compatibility for those games. So, I mean, what's the point in the end that if they don't have the game you want to play, they only have a small handful? It's just so they can say that they have it for the fans. For some reason, it makes the fans really excited, but I, for me personally, I, I don't really get it. If they could even just add some kind of emulation to just be able to play any game from the original Xbox in its original resolution. That's like, basically what it is. That's what I want them to do. Just make an yeah. emulator that plays most of the games. Like That's basically what the Xbox 360 had. I think that would make a lot of people Xbox. happy, even if it isn't enhanced. Just well, be that's, able to do that. that's what that's basically what they're already doing with the Xbox 360. Most games aren't enhanced, but uh, it's just it's a game by game process. Well, people want that because they don't want to have to own all of the old systems. Most people will sell their old systems. They don't like having old systems hooked up to their TV right. anymore. So that's yeah. the point of it but if it, if it's the support is spotty then half your library is sitting there and for a lot of those people you describe might not even have their original discs anymore so they're going to have to rebuy the games now now yeah they want that's what they want them compatible, to do is it can you actually you put go. the discs in or or do you need to download yes. them Yes, they they did confirm that if you have the original Xbox discs, that they will work as long as as it's a game that's supported by backward compatibility. But yes, they will definitely be selling games on the store. 
So they revealed Assassin's Creed Origin as well at the Microsoft conference. And I know, Mr. Jakes, you and I have both been playing in the Assassin's Creed series. What did you think of it? Uh, I think it looks great. I mean, it's gonna, it's what we wanted, basically, as far as we can tell so far. Everybody was expecting it to be to take place in ancient Egypt, and it really hasn't been... It's been leaked, supposedly, before that that's what it was going to be, but we didn't have any final confirmation until recently that that's really what it was. And, yeah, it, it looks good. And um, a lot of people are still wondering about whether it's going to have a present day story with it. I'm sure it will have something of some point. Of some, uh, it'll have some court, sort of um, probably cut scenes or something showing the present day story. But we don't know if it's going to have like an actual protagonist like the older games had. And they probably aren't going to reveal that until it comes out yeah. or until close to when it comes out like they have with previous games. But overall, I think it looks great. As usual, yeah, they don't tell you any of that, but we do know it is in the Animus. The kind of they do show that yeah. we've got kind of that Animus UI on there. I think the graphics looked really great. Uh, supposedly, they're using uh, checkerboarding to get the Xbox One X up to full 4K. So it's not really; it's like half 4K, really, which is similar to what the PS4 Pro has been doing on most of their games so mm -hmm. it, again it's hard to say if the xbox one x is even going to be that much better than the ps4 pro yeah i didn't realize that they were making such a big deal at their conference how it's it's true 4k where you actually have all 8 billion pixels or whatever it was that's that's really disillusioning to look, hear that i didn't realize that yeah it's a lot of similar uh upscaling tricks that they're employing on the ps4 pro but they do look very good in practice because of the checkerboarding method is very hard to detect by the human eye due to the way the the motion is but uh the game itself looked uh, looked really good the graphics i think the extra year of development looks like it's uh it's been a good thing for it but they've changed it pretty substantially i mean uh, yeah. i i heard rumors that there's no map anymore the mini map is gone and I, I feel like I'm going to be sitting there pressing the select button, expecting it to come up still. I still feel like that should yeah. come up when I press select. Um, but you do get the, you got the eagle now that can scout around and scope things out, find the enemies. And it's kind of like, I feel like that kind of serves the same purpose as the eagle vision would when you go yeah. on a lookout in the previous game. I thought, game. So this, I thought is like this is what should literal. be called Eagle Vision. Now they, yeah, now this, is quite literal, vision, this is literally quite literal Eagle Vision. Eagle vision. Maybe this is where the term Eagle Vision comes from. Because this is, they said... This oh, is yeah, the that's what they the should say. That's story. what they should say in the story. This is where the term originated. <laughs> I'll from. bet that's what they do. That's a good idea. Yeah. Well, whenever they change something in the Assassin's Creed series, when I see it like from the previews, usually I'm like, "Oh no, they're changing it. I liked it the way it was. They should just I'm not going to get used to this." But actually when I saw the um the gameplay footage at the Microsoft conference and they were using it, I thought, "Actually, this works pretty well." I thought right away, like you, you can take control of the eagle and then you can you can tag um enemies by by seeing them from o overhead it looks like they deliberately placed like holes in the ceiling though so that you can see <laughs> the guards through the through the ceiling but That's but yeah, it was point. it was what fun are you gonna do when you get it indoors <laughs> uh i i think that it seems like an overall trend in open world games is going to make it so things are a little more organic where it's not just that you're looking at a map and icons appear that you actually have to find things yourself and it, it makes sense that assassin's creed would move in that direction right it's definitely what they're doing and there's more rpg elements here and even the ui the menus are kind of like the menus in destiny where you have to like move the cursor around onto the icons and it's got there's apparently different levels for the different equipment you can pick up and stuff all of that is new and uh, I think for most of us hardcore Assassin's Creed fans, we'll just have to kind of roll with it, and hopefully it'll you know it'll just work, and it won't be bothersome. But there's always something annoying. I mean, we're always kind of positive. Like before Unity came out, we were also impressed by it, and then <laughs> when it came out, everybody trashed it. So we'll have to wait and see. At the Ubisoft conference, they also showed Skull and Bones, which is a pirate game. 
And this game looks a lot like Assassin's Creed. Did you did you see the gameplay? Well, they literally said before they introduced it that they were basing it on one of their most popular franchises. I think the guy said, and then they basically said, like, yeah, this is just expanding on the um, the ship battles from from Assassin's Creed three and and four and making it into its own game. This is what I've been saying they need to do all along. I think they might be a little late here because uh, Assassin's Creed Four that was like that was three years ago when people were talking about that. I mean that was the the pirate craze was in full yeah, swing. Yeah, I think you know, in, in to some extent, I think they're trying to cash in a little bit on that was kind of their most ex- like the most popular Assassin's Creed game in a long time, and everybody really liked the pirate theme. And I think that but that's not the direction Assassin's Creed is going in. Like even Origin, you're not seeing people are. Hoping the ship yeah, battles would come they, back, and they're, they're not. trying to do the best of both worlds because they don't want to keep Assassin's Creed a pirate game forever. So they're making <laughs> a different series, I guess, or a different game at least. It's a good idea. I'm happy with it. I'm happy with that. Well, too. my only thing about it is like I would. It looks like anyway from what they showed that it's mostly just a multiplayer game, and I'm I don't know if I really want to play through a whole. I don't know. You can't play through a, a multiplayer game, really. No, I, I probably I probably won't get it. I'm trying to just <laughs> find a way to push those push those pirate fans off of my Assassin's Creed franchise. Get them off. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I'm I was with them. I I thought four was the greatest Assassin's Creed game in a long time too. I really liked. It really felt like a full pirate simulation, not just the ships and like uh, the the parts that took place off of the ships and and things like that. So yeah, now this is just focusing on the ships. It's got more in depth gameplay. Like you've got to worry about the wind and the waves more than you used to and that kind of stuff. So uh, it, I'm sure that there's definitely a lot of people who are going to like this, especially people who are okay with the, the online multiplayer and want to do that as their main diversion and everything. But for people who want a story and, and just a one-player campaign, it looks like that this is either not going to have that at all or maybe that's not the main focus of the game. Yeah, we'll see. So they also, at the Microsoft, they showed that Minecraft now is going to have cross-platform uh network play along with the uh the switch so you're going to be able to play now on the xbox along with people who are playing on the switch so that was big news i know they've been kind of talking about doing something like this for a while but no playstation sony has said they don't want any part of this what do you think well, what I heard is that they said that they're most worried about the user experience for like for kids and stuff being able to hear voice chat from from people who are not on the PlayStation network. And I wonder if that's more of just an excuse or something. Cause yeah, I thought because Nintendo's allowing it. Yeah, they could so at least if they're so worried sense. about it, then just turn off voice chat for people who aren't on the PlayStation network. You can't voice chat yeah. across platforms, but you can still play with people across platforms. That would be I think lots of people would be happy enough with that if that's their main reason for not doing it. I think that's more of an excuse. Rocket League was also announced. Same deal with Rocket League. No PlayStation, but you've got the Switch and the Xbox and the PC. Um, Rocket League is one where I might actually play it if I was able to play online with you guys on your respective consoles. But uh, Minecraft, I'll leave that to the Minecraft kids. I, I think the trend with this is, again, like talking about different meanings of platform where there are certain games that that want to become their own their own platform that that transcends consoles and and can be played across a lot of different devices and it'll be really interesting to see if that becomes the norm in the future or if this is just kind of a an experiment that doesn't go anywhere well like traditionally it seems like these these cross platform games are mostly just they they don't seem to do like big budget like first person shooters and things like that i mean wake me up when the first like like big budget like call of duty or something is cross platform it it might happen sooner than you think that's yeah it that's what happen. i'm expecting i think i think they're testing the waters with these the, we need these games to open but the it seems gates. like now every time you hear about it it's like something like rocket league or minecraft when i mean not saying they're not good games or anything but no it's it's always been rocket league it's just that we need to get that to happen first and then the triple a titles will come eventually but what we need to see also is sony getting on board i think their main thing is just for their business they're just not sure if they want any part of this they i think they've enjoyed having their closed off network Mm -hmm. and 
They're yep. not sure. I think they're, they, it's the same reason as always. It's the real reason. They want people who have friends that have the PlayStation to, to all have to buy PlayStation systems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Microsoft has kind of open embraced this openness lately with like in, opening up everything to Windows and all that, which is their stuff. They anyway. decided it was more profitable for them to tap into both markets, and PlayStation wants to wants to keep it closed, and they're trying to, to get more money from people all having to buy their systems. We'll see how that goes once PlayStation's the underdog again. PlayStation's in the happens. position of, of power, right? Like, like Sony's goal is to just be this ubiquitous thing that people don't have very strong opinions about, but they feel like this is just the thing they have to have because everything's on it. And so closing it off is in their best interest. Whereas if Microsoft's trying to, to weasel in, I think it's really interesting for Minecraft to play online on the Switch, you'll need to have a live account from Microsoft, which which makes sense, but that's that's different, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, the the first thing I watched this year for E3 was the EA conference, and they showed Need for Speed Payback. Uh, what do you think, Mister Jigs? Um. Well, I don't. I don't know. As usual with these games, you have to actually play them before you know whether they're, they're going to be good or not. I mean, it's Ghost again, and we got some. We got really different games, I think, with Rivals and Need for Speed 2015. Was it? So I don't know. It looks good right now, but again, we're going to have to really play it. It's more story driven this time, so it kind of reminds me of like a Need for Speed Undercover or that kind of thing. So it looks like it could be good because I actually, at first, I was really impressed and happy with the previous Need for Speed game, but that quickly wore off the further I played yeah, it. Yeah, this, got but this sounds it annoying. It sounds similar to what they said when when they introduced that game too. They're like, "Oh, it's gonna have cutscenes with real actors, and it's gonna bring the series back to when they used to have like the real actors and the cutscenes and stuff like that, and the cheesiness of it." And it delivered on that a little bit, but it still didn't feel the same as those old games they were promising it was going to be similar to if it's more mission driven then i'll like it well i yeah i'm really curious to see how much of the game is actually in those like set piece story missions versus just uh you know driving up a hill as as quickly as possible versus like wandering around the open world um yeah you know it's they they showed the action sequence but i'm pretty confident that's going to be the thing you spend the least of your time on compared to just wandering around or doing races yeah um i also can't really know it's it's interesting like you can't tell about performance issues at this point with e3 you know like the the video i saw of of need for speed had a lot of dropped frames and I don't know whether it was a problem with the recording or or the stream or if it was actually dropped frames in the in the game itself. But there was some also some interesting performance things with that. Like there's a part where these guys driving the bad guy cars need to be taken out, and the the player who who was demonstrating this got ahead of them, and he was looking in his rearview mirror, and they were just swerving all over the place and crashing on their own and doing all this stupid stuff. And then he, he <laughs> yeah. ends up saying, I need to slow down to let them catch up to me. And the, the guy from, from EA who's representing it says, no, don't do that. And, you know, it wasn't really quite as polished as I think they hoped it would look. Yeah. Well, this is alpha game at this point. So, yeah, but that is, you know, when it's all scripted like that, that is a problem. I mean, they're just nudging these other cars, and then, you know, you can hit the traffic and you're fine, but then the enemies, of course, just veer off and explode from, <laughs> from just nudging them. And that's, But that's the way it has to work. That's their brand. I mean, it's almost like the video game equivalent of Fast and the Furious. Now, oh, definitely. They're clearly inspired by that. I think the performance issues are are just they always say that it's just the stream but it, who knows but I think drop frames are a little bit more of a thing of the past you don't see them as much these days you mostly see frame rate drops but not full on like stutters in a lot of newer games and these again these are alpha footage games so I'm not expecting to see a lot of that in the final products but who knows they they just always blame it on the stream I don't. I don't know what. Maybe maybe your Xbox One is is really impressive after all, because I feel like I see dropped frames and stutters and completed games on the PS4 well, thought, and Switch all the time. I thought your time. big thing was your big thing was screen tearing. Oh yeah, like that's unacceptable. Enabled all the time. 
Well, at the Ubisoft conference, they also unveiled the crew, too. What did you think of that? Well, that seemed like the complete opposite direction from Need for Speed, right? Like, one was trying to be fast and furious, and the crew, too, was almost refreshing in how uh, bland it seemed. <laughs> well, the trailer was all motorsports. Yeah, they're taking a different direction with the, all the different vehicles and stuff, because they got to differentiate themselves more from Need for Speed, I think. Well, I was excited about it, because actually, when I'm honest with myself now, um, Mr. Jakes and I both played through a good portion of the crew. We didn't finish it, either of us, because, I mean, who has the time? But, uh, I mean, I, in retrospect, I would definitely say I enjoyed the crew more than the previous Need for Speed game, because Need for Speed was just so annoying when all the little <laughs> uh, all the little weird things it would do, but the, the crew was actually more, like, hit the mark, I think, in terms of open-world racer with little missions to do. It's got just enough story to keep you invested, and I hope to see more of that with the crew, too. It looks like they're expanding a little bit on the vehicles you can drive and stuff, and I'm actually pretty excited about it. Yeah, it's funny you say that, because I, I kind of feel the same way, too. It's weird. I was looking back, I actually got the Platinum Trophy on the on Need for Speed 2015, because it has separate trophies for the online um, trophies and the and the offline ones, so it, you're able to nice. get the Platinum just by doing the, the offline ones. So I must have spent a lot of time playing that game, and the goals were more focused on Need for Speed, I think is why I ended up doing them. But still, like you said, the crew had more the whole package. Like, the, the story was all there, and it had it seemed really fleshed out. The world was really expansive and everything, and it was actually, in, in retrospect, it seems like almost the better game, yeah. yeah. I think it was announced for next year, early 2018. We saw a lot of early 2018 at this show, and when I see that, that's like the kiss of death for me, because almost nothing comes out in the early part of the year. Anytime you see something that's announced for early 2018 or 2000 whatever year it is, that's just to string people along. I mean, that those things always get delayed until spring or fall, so we're going to see a lot of that next year, I think. Yeah, and a lot of these games are probably games that were meant to be done this fall and just didn't make it on time, too. So they have got their uh, new Sonic game coming this year. That is something that we are going to see supposedly this fall, unless that gets delayed. Sonic Forces, what do you think of this? I mean, I think I think it looks like one of the more interesting things that's coming out this year, right? I mean, Sonic Generations was awesome, and I would be really excited to play another game like that. Yeah, it's a and it's a true Sonic Team game, mm-hmm. right? So yeah, I mean, this is. This isn't like Sonic Boom where it was outsourced and it was just garbage. This is a real Sonic game this time. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, new customizable character turns out. I mean, they've got uh, a gun and some gadgets, so I'm curious if it'll turn out kind of like Shadow the Hedgehog or, uh, or Ratchet and Clank or something like that. But uh, overall, it looks really solid. People are talking fairly often in the in the footage they showed i i'm curious if if when you do like time trials or missions if if they'll turn that off i i really hope that you have a chance to switch the voices back to japanese i i always prefer playing things with the yeah. original voices and there are certain games like sonic, sonic where especially. i think people are pretty opinionated about that and they want the choice well the english voices have switched too many times but uh, mm-hmm. the, the Japanese voices, we've had this consistent same voice for Sonic, and I'm used to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, you know, with, with Sonic, it's cartoony, and so and so it's normal to hear cartoony voices. Some of those other uh, games where the characters are adults and it's more realistic, for me, it's really jarring to hear the English voices where it's like, oh, hey, it's Leonardo from Ninja Turtles talking now. It's like, it's hard for me to take it seriously. I, I know this sounds really snobby to be like, I only play them in the original Japanese, but I do. I, <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and so, like, sometimes you'll see, like, YouTube clips or the, the trailers for things. It was really weird for me to hear, hear like, Final Fantasy XV in English when they did the, the trailer for the, the DLC for that. I might actually play Final Fantasy XV now because they announced uh, Xbox One X mode on that. Maybe I'll play it in, in, 
in 4K. Nah, you probably shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, I okay, I, pl- okay. I I spent way more time on that. I I feel like I'm I'm a much less happy person because I started playing open world games this year and I played through all of Final Fantasy 15 and I'm working on Breath of the Wild and it's just it's just too much. And and Final Fantasy 15, <laughs> it was kind of funny like seeing the um the DLC trailers for both of those games where with Breath of the Wild, it really made sense where it's like, clearly this is a game they expect to sell a lot more. The Switch install base is still relatively small. This is going to be in print for another couple years probably. Makes sense to keep people excited about it. But the Final Fantasy 15 trailer really just seemed, and I know this game has some dedicated fans that I would piss off by saying this, but it just really seemed desperate. Like, we really worked hard on this and we really need more people to buy it, so... Like, maybe if you already have the PS4 version and you get the Xbox One X, you could buy it again, maybe? Like, we, we really were counting on selling this a lot they more than we did. You almost got me. You just stopped me. I was about to do it. I mean, like, maybe you'd like... I was really addicted to it for a while. I, I got pretty much every trophy except for the one for fishing. And if I ever get a PSVR, maybe that'll help me finally get my fishing level up to 10. <laughs> Mr. Jakes, are you going to get Sonic Forces? Um... Uh... I don't know. Probably. I mean, I haven't played a Sonic game in a long time, so maybe it's about time. We we always did when they came out. We yeah, always that's right. got we them. Used to. This one's this is going to be one of the few games we're all going to be able to play on the Switch and uh, the other two consoles. So yeah, I'm planning to get it. I for one don't really understand why they're doing the same thing they did again with Sonic Generations. Why do they have like new Sonic and old Sonic? Like they're two separate characters. Because people said they liked that game. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just trying to please the fans. The fans, I feel like the internet has been trolling Sonic for so long now <laughs> that he hasn't been able to do anything right except for maybe Sonic Generations. So they, they, yeah. Sega's at a loss now where they're just like, okay, whatever. Like, if this is what you like, we'll just rehash that again. Yeah. But, I mean, the two Sonics are, it's the same Sonic. Sonic never changed. The old Sonic and the new Sonic, it's not two separate so characters. So like the you like the way they did it in Generations better. No, it's the same thing. I don't want them to rehash gener- the idea from Generations. It was a one-time gimmick. Why are they bringing back this two Sonic <laughs> universe oh, okay. again? I had like, it backwards it does- there. Nah, come on. Like, like Sonic Generations is probably the best 3D Sonic game ever. And and if they can make it as close to that and just have new levels and new music and and all that, like that's all we want. Quit. Quit yeah, dissuading sure, them. This is, that, but this is one of the few times a company's doing exactly what we've been asking. It it's took the them same, five years. It's the same Sonic, though. They're they're ruining the <laughs> the the story of it. Like the, it's the. They I'm could sure they'll have justify the same it. Sonic do they could just say it's 2D levels and 3D levels. That's it. They don't need to confuse us by having two Sonics. Well, no, because because since since Sonic Unleashed, they've had new Sonic doing 2D levels as well, and it plays differently. And I think. I really liked having the mix of having new style 2D, 3D hybrid levels and the old style Sonic. I actually, the one, one of the few things I didn't like about Generations was toward the end, um, you got a homing attack for, for classic Sonic. And I, I felt like that made them too similar. It would have been better without it. Um, the, the weird thing about Sonic is they just, they can't do well with everyone. Like there's too big and diverse a fan base. You know, you've got the hardcore Sega fans who've been with them since before Sonic was their mascot. And then you've got these fans who really didn't get into Sonic until he went multi-platform. Like these are like, it almost seems like there are more Nintendo fans who like Sonic than Sega fans now, uh, just cause there are more Nintendo fans period. And so how do you please all these different people? And again, you've got these, you know, yeah. you've got these adults who've been playing it for a long time, but you're also trying to sell it to kids. Yeah, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. It's almost like you got really two distinct like groups of Sonic fans: the people who played the really old ones, who just said like it was only good back then and it sucks now and everything. And you can try to entice them back in with games like Sonic Generations. They succeeded. It was awesome. I'm kind of alone here, and I I think that the only real misstep Sonic has done 
was Sonic 2006 as terms of the mainstream Sonic games. I know there's all kinds of other crap in there, like like Sonic Boom, like messing it up and making just tarnishing Sonic's name. But for me, like I I enjoyed Sonic Unleashed and all that stuff. I I Sonic 2006 was the one legitimately like game that was really riddled with problems. So as long as they make a new one that's pretty decent, I'll be happy and I'll play it. But I know I'm in the minority with that, so they have to kind of be careful. How how they tread with this one well they don't care that much about fans like you because you're gonna buy it anyway right <laughs> mm-hmm. they're trying to please all the non-fans well that's the problem too always trying to please the people who are never gonna be happy anyway <laughs> yeah well even though some of those people seemed pretty won over by generations so maybe yeah they're just trying yep. to do the same thing again like you said and they've forgotten generations already the the one thing that I I'm worried about with with Sonic Forces is will I buy it for the Switch or the PS4? You know, so far all the multi-platform stuff for the Switch has been it hasn't been very demanding, and so you didn't have that much of a technical compromise. But even stuff like I am Setsuna, like the frame rates lower, or um, you know, like the the Dragon Quest Warriors games uh, don't run as well, like. I don't know if I want the portability of the Switch or the performance of the PS4, and who knows? Maybe maybe the PS4 one won't even be ideal unless you have uh, you know one of the 4K consoles. Um, so maybe I'll have to buy it twice. I don't know. Wow, they really got you. Do you actually <laughs> use the Switch portably a lot? Sometimes, not as much as most people seem to. They could release Assassin's Creed Origin or or Need for Speed or something like that down the line. Port well, that's what they're talking about already. Like they're not announcing most of those types of games for the Switch, and a lot of people were wondering whether they would or not. Mm, mm -hmm. It's still Nintendo has their own separate segment of the market. It just seems, yeah, it seems the same as it was with the the Wii U. Really, they were saying, oh, it's powerful enough for for all these games too. But I I guess other other problems surfaced later on with the architecture and and issues with porting games but this time people were wondering again if they were gonna well i think we could see more of it and more third-party support because the switch is doing better than the wii u so far well i think also with these newer things like the xbox one x and the ps4 pro like the the companies who really want to have cutting edge graphics and, and stuff like that are gonna stick with the microsoft and sony consoles and maybe ignore the switch still because the switch is quite a bit more powerful i mean it's it's more powerful than their previous systems but still it's not going to be it's not going to measure up to the well it's, it's not that much more powerful i mean we have a direct comparison with zelda zelda runs at 720p on the wii u and then on the switch it runs at 720p in undock yeah mode, that's a good and point in dock mode it's 900p so it's not a huge difference okay and moving on sakuna of rice and ruin steer at what did you think of this game so like i i'm never that interested in in the 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 big major stuff i'm usually looking for stuff more on the edges especially japanese games and there wasn't really much of that like you know with with xbox they they don't have Raiden Five as a as a, an exclusive anymore. They canceled Scalebound. They really have been ignoring Japan. Um, so anyway, this this uh, this game Sakuna of Rice and Ruin. It's made by Edelweiss. It's a it's a, an indie Japanese company that made a shooter called Astabreed that's pretty decent. And I I just was really excited to see just a, a platform game. But then it also has rice farming elements, and and I got a lot less it's interested. It's also Harvest than, Moon. Yeah, yeah, like I I don't know whether it'll be good or not, but you know, Act Razor was able to to do yeah. simulation and action together, so I think it's one to watch. It it might turn out badly, it might be really good, but but I thought it looked interesting, and it was something that I hadn't heard of until E three. That's what I was reminded of right away, Act Razor. So if they balance it well enough and it's fun enough it could be really interesting another um game that was kind of off the beaten path that that looked really good to me um you know like realistically i'm most excited about about mario odyssey and sonic forces but maybe my game of the show especially since it hadn't been announced until this is is sushi striker for the 3ds so this is made by indie zero they're the company that made the um Game Center CX Retro Game Challenge games on the DS and NES Remix, which are all awesome. Um, and this is a puzzle game. It's a head-to-head action puzzle game 
where you eat sushi and throw the plates at each other and you know it's it's not perfect in my mind but but it's about as close as as you're going to get in this market i was wondering why you were interested in that but i guess with the developers are if they're the ones who made those game centers cx games and stuff like that then maybe it's worth watching well, and I, you know, I mean, I know you mentioned earlier before we started recording how uh, the game kind of looked like a cell phone game, and you know, I, I think that I'd rather have it be 2D than 3D, and and yeah, it looks a little cheap. Ideally, this would be something that is like an arcade game and has good enough graphics and and it's fast enough pace that people would be willing to put money into a machine as they walk past, but. You know, those days are long gone, and accepting that it's not going to be arcade quality, otherwise it pretty much hits all the right all the right checkboxes for me, of being an action head-to-head puzzle game that's got interesting, quirky characters, and it's made by a developer I like. But isn't it also basically a touchscreen game where you play with the stylus? Yeah, I mean, there are some good stylus games. I mean, Meteos was So, I mean, was, it seems like, really that's why I thought it seems like game. it would be perfect as a smartphone game, really. Yeah, maybe they'll port it to that eventually. Well, it it will just come down to whether or not it's fun when it comes out. It looks like something that you would be interested in if it's executed well. Uh, There's also a a fighter that's coming, Blade Strangers. Looks like it's going to be kind of a a Western-Japanese collaboration, the way they're framing it. Uh, well, you know, it's it's being made for a, a Western publisher, right, Nicholas? But um, I think the developers are the same people who did the the um, Shining Force fighting game that came out a few years ago. And basically, my, my take on, on this game is they had the assets from Code of Princess, which is this um, spiritual successor to Guardian Heroes on the 3DS, um, where... Uh, and and you know it, people people didn't like Code of Princess as much as they should have. It's not a it's not a perfect game by any means, but I think a lot of people might say it's as good or better than Advanced Guardian Heroes. So so it's this game where they have all these these fighting animations, and they had this technique for making them. And I figure they said, what what else can we do with this? And they said, I guess we'll make a fighting game, and we also have the rights for Cave Story. And and Umihara Kawase and and they put it all together and it's just completely out of left field, right? And I think they said the music was going to be Western made, so that's kind of where I got the idea. It's somewhat of a collaboration, but yeah, the animations all Japanese. Um, I thought uh, some of the characters were a little bit pervy, like kind of a hentai thing going on with them. So I don't know about that aspect, but otherwise it looked like a, a decent fighting game. Yeah, we'll see. It might turn out to be terrible, but it just, I mean, it's definitely one to watch where where I was completely surprised. I think that game collectors who like stuff like Cave Story and Code of Princess and, and Umi Harakawase are, are just excited to see that there's something acknowledging those games that are relatively obscure. Okay, any other games from E3 that we didn't talk about? Anything else that you're excited about? Yeah, well, um, there are a few games that I'm excited about that really didn't have much of an E3 showing. So one of, one of the things I'm really excited about is Vanillaware's upcoming game, 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. And they did do a new trailer for that, but it, it was almost exactly the same as last year's trailer. So that was kind of disappointed that they didn't have more to show. And like, we don't even know exactly what kind of game it is. Other than that, it has really impressive visuals and it involves robots. And then there's the Hideo Kojima game um, that they announced last year, Death Stranding. They they didn't have anything at, at E3 this year. Hopefully that's still coming along well. Yeah, some of these seem like really far off announcements when they when we got them last year. So who knows? Well, it wasn't really E3, but a little while ago they released some footage of Rap Rabbit which is sort of a spiritual successor to Parappa the Rapper. So did you guys see the the footage that they have so far of this that they kind of put out? It's sort of almost like a mock-up of what the game's going to look like. I saw a little bit. Is it, Was this a Kickstarter game? I thought It, it, was. it yeah. is a Kickstarter. Uh, it ends in a couple days, and it is very far from hitting its funding goal, which is really sad uh, because, again, like Nana Onsha and Enos are are both companies like Indie Zero, where I'm always following them, looking for their next game. And I I was so excited about this. 
and they announced that it was happening a day or two before they announced that it was a Kickstarter. And then the Kickstarter ran into some snags where they they had the, the Nintendo Switch port pretty far down, and so a lot of fans were complaining about that. And really, it, it's looking like it's not going to get funded. I was hoping that Nintendo or Sony or somebody was going to swoop in and announce at E3 that they were funding it and it was going to happen because it, it's looking like it isn't now. Did you support it did you oh yeah no i i put down a quite a bit of money i i think the 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 moral of this is don't trust other people and like the next time a dream collaboration comes out you just need to sell your house and and fund it all yourself like if if we ever get a new kickstarter with a game that has music from the lords of thunder people and the worldwide soccer composer i just need to fund that whole sucker myself because otherwise it's not going to happen you're talking about T's music and the Sega composer Jun Senoue. Well, you you really want to play this game, don't you? <laughs> I do. I mean, I I loved Elite Beat Agents and Oendon and and Parappa. Like like th- these are great games, and I, I want more of that. Um, but the interesting thing about Kickstarter, I don't know if you guys were were Mighty Number no. Nine backers, but I got an email a few days ago saying that. My physical rewards are going to come eventually. They're they're going into manufacturing, and at the end of the summer, they're supposed to come out. Uh, level five, like bot concept, or they merged or something. And I guess part yeah, of that is they're they're they basically making basically sold it off. They're they're making my my uh, empty box and manual that I bought, and my flash drive that has the PC version of Mighty Number no. Nine before they announced that it was going to get a physical release on any other platforms. Those are finally going to come in just a few more months. So the, the <laughs> message of this is that Kickstarter works, and people should have funded my Rap Rabbit game. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I bought Mighty Number no. Nine, but no, I've never. I haven't kicked in any money on Kickstarters. I think the the age of Kickstarters is slowly flickering out. People are getting kind of disillusioned. Yeah, with well, what's happening? I mean, Mighty Number no. Nine so. kickstarted it and killed it all in one in one swoop, pretty much, right? <laughs> well, there were other big Kickstarters before. Yeah, Shenmue Three and Bloodstained. It was one of the first big ones. Were were about a year later before Correct. things were going awry with Mighty Number no. Nine, and then a few weeks later they announced Red Ash, that uh, Mega Man Legends follow up, uh, and that's when it all yeah. went to oh, hell. Yeah, that... Like that that yeah. was the one where like they they released a demo that just looked really cheap, and they announced midway through the campaign that a Chinese company was going to fund it and make it happen regardless of whether the goals were met. And it actually got negative funding where there were more people withdrawing their their backing than adding contributions for a couple of days. And so yeah. so luckily mm-hmm. Shenmue 3 and Bloodstained got in a few weeks before Red Ash was a debacle and before Mighty Number no. 9 uh, started getting pushed back. But uh, yeah, I'm thinking Shenmue 3 and these might be some of the last big ones that we see, at least mm-hmm. for a while. I kind of feel like people are, are kind of moving on from this and going back to yeah. more traditionally yeah. funding games. Yeah, no, I assumed that kickstarting games like these was gone, and I was surprised that Rap Rabbit was on. I was like, all right, are we going to try this again? Let's make this happen. And and clearly it is it is not working. <laughs> well, I'm disappointed cuz the the game footage that I saw was interesting. I mean, it kind of just had still images with the rapping right now, yeah. but uh, it lets you choose the rap that you're going to do and then otherwise it's sort of the same kind of parappa thing. It looked interesting, funny just like the other Nana Oncha stuff. It'll be interesting to see what they do with the with what they made if they if they'll just completely abandon it. They should they should bring it to some public and try to get some investors on board and, and try to do it traditionally. They probably did before they went with Kickstarter. Well, well, that's the that's the catch-22, though. If you've got a failed Kickstarter, how do you convince people, hey, I've got this great concept. There was only, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 10% of the interest Nobody that wanted we thought to fund there it. would be. <laughs> you show them the success of the new Parappa HD remake and show them there's a demand. They can try. <laughs> I don't know if it was particularly successful, was it? I think some people thought that it, it the inputs didn't work quite as well on HD TVs. As... Oh well, well we'll see if this is the last that we ever hear of Rap Rabbit. I yeah, guess. I don't want to go on too much of a tangent with Kickstarter, but it seems to me that it works best with low budget.
budget games, like especially like people trying to do new homebrews for old systems and stuff like that that don't require quite as much funding to do. Like those kind of things seem more suited to Kickstarter to me. But there's also the volatility, though. With those smaller developers, you don't know if they're just going to evaporate or if it's one guy working as a fan, like how many years it's going to take to work on it. Yeah, but that's kind of the spirit of what Kickstarter is supposed to be about, isn't it? And that's part of the disappointment for people, too. Maybe people, they put real money in expecting to get real results sooner than later. I also think that people don't put enough value on making something happen. You know, they, they're comparing, like, it's $60 to buy a game that's already been funded and, and published is different from making sure that a game exists. Like, I find that it's worth more than $60 to do that. Yeah, well, that's exactly what it's supposed to be for. At, the, at a certain funding level, you get a copy of the game eventually for funding it. It's like a really long, in advance pre-reserve, basically. Well, no, no, I'm saying that it shouldn't be like that. I'm, uh, Yeah, I, no, but right now it's both, right? For the lower funders, they mm-hmm. can, usually for a kind of reasonable price, they can get a copy of the game, too, with their backing. And then there's people who can fund a lot more than that and get their name in the credits and all of that if they want. Mm-hmm. I think the problem is you've got people who are spending, like, $60 on a Kickstarter, and they expect it to be a AAA budget game when I don't think they realize how much it costs to make a game and... Their expectations are just unrealistic. So that's why Project Rap Rabbit was going to be awesome. And <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anything else that you guys want to talk about? Or, you know, one other thing like my least favorite part of E3 last year was in Sony's Sizzle Reel. They, they showed a, a quick glimpse of Days Gone, their, their zombie game. It was just this guy pointing a gun at another person. And, like, making this concerned face, like, he's trying to decide whether this person needs to be killed or not. And I just, I just thought that that was not what I'm really looking for when I'm trying to escape and and relax and play video games. And this year in Microsoft's conference, uh, kind of far into it, they showed um, State of Decay 2, which just one-upped it so many times over. Where it's it's basically like Doomsday Prepper, the game. At least the 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 narration for the trailer was like that. I was just like, "How will you survive when society collapses? What will you do?" And then toward the end, it's like, "And in this game, you get to decide whether to kill your neighbors or let them survive." And it's just like, "No, this is this is not my fun recreational escapism." But they they took it to the next level, right? They showed him saving her. <laughs> they they did, but but it's just like these doomsday prepper type people are the last people I want making life or death decisions. <laughs> this is not for you, Sturata. The zombie <laughs> genre is very popular right now. The Walking Dead is huge, and just zombie games in general. Zombies are still around. I I actually think that zombies are on their way out. There were there were fewer yeah, zombie yeah. games this year than before. We've I think reached. We've passed peak zombie. Yeah, yeah, we are. Is is there a way of getting a- around the uncanny valley where if you've got bad AI or the faces look kind of weird, you can have a zombie and then it's acceptable. And it seems like people have leaped the uncanny valley and and they're generally accepting of normal human characters now, right? I think this stuff will still sell. Uh, superheroes are still selling. Zombies are going to continue to sell for at least a little longer. People love The Last of Us. But I wouldn't go so far to say that we've gotten over the uncanny valley, though. I mean, certainly we've got really good-looking characters on a lot of games now, but... It's still going to look weird. <laughs> to oh, yeah, no, I, I mean, it looks weird, but for whatever reason, it seems like people are a lot more accepting of just human characters. And, I mean, it makes sense. Like, the characters in video, like, pretty much every game at E3 this year, the human characters look better than, like, Academy Award winning actors in, like, the Polar Express or, or Final Fantasy, <laughs> The Spirits Within. Like, like well, that... That was a long time ago. I, I guess, but those were those were super expensive pre-rendered Hollywood blockbusters, and now you can have something real time on a system that you can buy for two hundred fifty dollars if you get the Xbox One S. Uh, yeah, and, it, and it they looks can pre-render better. it now too. And the the pre-rendered stuff doesn't look too much different than the in-engine. Yeah, it, you really so. have a, a hard time nowadays telling the difference between in-engine. The only tell nowadays mm-hmm. is if it shows a whole bunch of different locations all at once without mm-hmm. loading time in between. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. Well, it sounds like our, our conversation's wrapping up here. Uh, hopefully that was something worth listening to. Uh, let us know in the comments what you think. I think there are a lot of things that are, that are worth arguing with, so we'd love to hear from you and we'll respond. And let us know if you'd like to hear more discussions like this and we might be able to, to put together some more in the future. Thanks again. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe to Basement Brothers for more content from us. Right on. Let's do this again sometime. Yep. Well, see you all again next time then.